listening to the Becoming Who You Are podcast, your guide to authentic living. Visit becomingwhoyouare.net for more resources, tools, and suggestions designed to help you create the life you want from the inside out. Now here's your host, Hannah. Hello, and welcome to the Becoming Who You Are podcast. My name is Hannah, and thank you so much for joining me today. Before we get into this week's podcast, I just want to let you know about a new journaling course that I'm offering through Becoming Who You Are. It's called Working From The Heart, and it's part of a series of courses called Living From The Heart that help you explore different aspects of authentic living. As you might be able to guess, Working From The Heart is about the work that we do. It's a 14-day e-course that is designed to provide you with clarity around what meaningful and authentic work looks like to you. By the end of the two weeks, you'll have a much better idea of how to lessen the gap between where you currently are and where you ideally want to be with your work. You can find out more details about the course and sign up over at www.becomingwhoyouare.net. This week, I want to talk about feedback. Feedback is something that is so important, not only to give, but also to receive. It's how we know where we're at with our relationships and how we can communicate our authentic needs and preferences to others and hear theirs in return. The most common context in which we encounter feedback is in a business environment. So, for example, if you go to a restaurant, the server will usually ask you how your food is during and or after the meal or you might get a little feedback slip uh, with your bill. Additionally, if you buy something online, you will usually get a customer service email asking for feedback. If you buy something on an auction site, you'll be able to rate the individual transaction and seller. Shops, clinics, cafes, supermarkets or grocery stores for the US crowd all have means for customers and clients to offer their feedback. And sometimes when you spend a lot of time in retail environments, it can seem like everybody wants a piece of your feedback. This is because once they have your feedback, they know what works, they know what doesn't work, and they know what they can do to make the relationship between you and them better. So my question for you today is, why don't we do this in our personal lives? Have a quick think about the last time that you asked your spouse, your partner, your children, friends, siblings, other family members, whoever is important in your life for feedback and really, really asked, sat down and said, how do you experience me? How do you experience this relationship? Is there anything you'd like to change? What would you like to see more of? Or what do you feel is left unresolved at the moment? This isn't something that we're taught to do. No one asked me outright for feedback in a personal relationship until I was in my early 20s. Next time you visit a bookshop, take a look at the shelf marked relationships. Most, if not all of the books on that shelf are about what to do when your relationship is in crisis or when you're newly single or when you're unable to find a long-term stable relationship. But what about nurturing relationships? What about the prevention of these crises rather than the solution? I believe a lot of that prevention lies in feedback and that's why I want to talk about this today. Asking someone you respect and care about for feedback can feel really, really uncomfortable at first because it's just not something that we're used to doing. Sometimes we're afraid of the answers. Sometimes we're afraid that as a result of the feedback they give, something might change or we might feel compelled to change aspects of the relationship. Sometimes we're also afraid of just taking responsibility. So taking responsibility for our feelings, for our behaviors, and hearing the impact that they have had on other people and expressing the impact that other people's behaviors and other people's feelings have had on us too. As hard as it is, feedback is so crucial for good relationships. With feedback, there's no guesswork or gray areas involved. You both know where you stand and you both have information about what you can do to make the relationship even more awesome than it already is. In general, there are three types of feedback you might find yourself giving and receiving. The first is positive feedback. The second is not quite so positive feedback. And the third is unsolicited feedback. And for those of you that have never heard that phrase before, um, I'm using unsolicited feedback to describe those times when you really, really want to tell someone what you think, but they haven't actually asked you. And they haven't given you any indication that they really want your feedback. This situation can be quite a conundrum. First of all, let's start with the good stuff. This is the positive feedback. 
Things that fall under the category of positive feedback include things like compliments, gratitude and appreciation. I just want to say a couple of things about compliments because we all know how it feels to be on the end of a genuine compliment and it feels really nice. It feels um, very warming, very validating. But at the same time, there is a category of compliments that we might come across that I think most of us probably have come across where ostensibly on the surface, what the person is saying sounds like a compliment, but at the same time, we're thinking, really, was that supposed to be praise? What I'm talking about is those slightly awkward times when people say things like, I didn't know who else to ask. You're the person I know who's least likely to screw it up or you're young slash old slash hip and know about these things. While we might know that they mean well when they say these things, there's still a part of us that thinks, uh, I'm not sure that 100% resonates with me as wholly positive feedback. Sometimes it can be really difficult to give compliments that come straight from the heart, and this is because they're a form of generosity. When we give someone a sincere compliment that is thought out, personal, and detailed, we are being vulnerable. I've talked quite a lot on this podcast about vulnerability before, and here I really, really want to impress that it's not just about showing our weaknesses, our hurt, our sadness, or being honest and transparent about so-called negative emotions. Vulnerability is about showing who we really are and what we feel, and that includes the good stuff, as well as the stuff that doesn't feel quite so comfortable. That's what makes compliments so difficult sometimes, because it can be kind of scary to say to someone, I really admire you for this, or I find your openness about that really inspiring, because we're revealing personal details about ourselves and the values that we hold in doing so. But a life without appreciation for others kind of sucks. Compliments help other people feel good. They increase the plus points in our relationships and they help us feel good about ourselves, even though what we're saying is directed at other people because we are being vulnerable and because we are showing our real selves, our authentic selves to them. The key difference between compliments that leave us feeling slightly unsure and compliments that leave us feeling really touched is the difference between making statements of fact and making them statements of feeling. So we could say to someone, that's a great idea. And while there's nothing wrong with that, a more personal and genuine version would be, I feel excited by what you said because I love the idea of doing X, Y, Z, for example, improving our communication or giving better feedback to each other. Another example could be, it was nice of you to pick me up after work, which could become, when you picked me up after work, I felt very grateful because I was feeling really stressed about my day and it was great to see you and spend some time talking with you. When I first started doing this and switching out labels like great or nice or kind and framing the compliment and the positive feedback more about my feelings and how I experienced the other person, I felt kind of silly to begin with. And I thought they're going to think I'm ridiculous because it sounds like I'm going really over the top here. But the fact is, is that you're not. And if you feel like you're really going over the top, don't be afraid of doing that. It's such a subtle switch in communication, but it really makes all the difference both to you as the person communicating the positive feedback and to the person receiving the positive feedback as well, because being on the end of that kind of feedback, it really feels like it's coming from the heart. So make it personal, make it insightful and make it from the heart. Most of all, make it about expressing yourself. The next kind of feedback I want to talk about is not so awesome feedback. We've all been in situations where someone we know and care about comes and asks us for feedback about something, which is great, except if you were to be honest, the feedback you would have about this particular thing isn't exactly super positive. If hearing not quite so positive feedback is difficult, it's just as hard for even semi-nice people to dish it out. After all, we don't want to come across as mean, critical and judgmental, especially not to people that we care about. Giving this type of feedback can be totally nerve-wracking and parts of us might be sitting there just waiting for the other person to get pissed off and start making horrible comments or throwing stuff or breaking down in tears of devastation as we stand there feeling like really horrible people. To get over this fear, we justify our silence with the belief that, well, there's something that even really good friends can't talk about, or we offer the Cliff Notes version of our feedback containing things that we think the other person will want to hear, and omitting the things that we are actually genuinely thinking. 
neither of those scenarios, neither the silence nor the cliff notes feedback, make for authentic relationships. And ultimately, it's often kinder and more helpful to the other person to give them your honest feedback. If you do talk about it, and you can take some of the principles we just talked about to do with positive feedback, where it's about you expressing your feelings and your experience, it can make such a huge difference. The way you approach not quite so positive feedback will make or break how it comes across. And this is where some planning can be really, really helpful. If you have some not quite so positive feedback to give someone, think about how you're going to approach it before diving straight in. There's no golden formula that's going to satisfy 100% of people receiving this feedback 100% of the time. But a good place to start might be something like, when you do A, I feel B because I have a need for C, and when you do A, I don't feel like that need is being met. So what would be really helpful for me is if you could do D. What that might look like in practice is, when we arrange to meet and you show up late without warning me, I feel annoyed. I have a need for security and respect, and when you don't tell me you're going to be late, I don't feel like that need is being met. So if you're not going to be able to make it on time, it would be really helpful to me if you could call me in advance to let me know. This is the most honest way of approaching not quite so awesome feedback because it's based on feelings and needs. The person saying the above is taking responsibility for their own feelings and needs, not putting it on the other person. And there's also a really specific request in there, which is the calling in advance in this example. It's not a demand, but it lets the other person know what they can do better to meet the speaker's needs in the future. You might also notice that there are no conversation no-nos. There's no name-calling, for example, you're late, you arsehole. There's no labelling, for example, the person's not saying you're so inconsiderate or anything like that. There's also no false obligation statements, like you shouldn't be late. There's also no phrases that I call eternity statements. These are things like you never show up on time or you're always late. If we want people to listen to us properly, it's not a good idea to use these statements because A, they're probably not 100% accurate, and B, they're going to provoke the other person's defenses. The other person's going to feel the need to defend themselves against that accusation. When we're giving not quite so positive feedback, it's also a good idea to start the conversation by giving some positive feedback first. There's a common feedback tool in business management called a positive sandwich, which is where you give a piece of positive feedback and then the negative feedback and then you follow up by finishing with some more positive feedback. By putting the positive feedback first, you're showing the other person that you value the relationship and you value them. The other person is less likely to become defensive, the conversation is less likely to turn into a conflict, and it puts a positive solution oriented spin on whatever problem or issue you're bringing up. When you give someone feedback, there is no obligation on them to change. You're simply offering them a different perspective and an opportunity to develop. That means that they might change what they're doing, and they might also choose not to. Ultimately, the result is something that's out of our control. While they might not necessarily act on your feedback, it's important to remember that giving feedback is not just about the other person. It's also about us and our happiness. Just like positive feedback, being able to give people less than positive feedback is about giving ourselves a voice and expressing our needs and preferences too. Thinking about our relationships in terms of our needs will help us become more conscious of what we want from them in the future. The last piece of feedback I want to discuss is unsolicited feedback. Like I said at the beginning of this episode, Unsolicited feedback is when we really, really want to give someone feedback about something that they're doing or that they said, but they haven't actually asked for it and potentially haven't even given us any indication that they want feedback about it. This is tricky because often we mean well. We want to do right by our friend and sometimes it can feel like they really, really need to hear this advice. We might feel that as their friend, it's our duty to give them this feedback. But do they really want to hear it? Is it even our place to give it? Generally, I'm not a fan of unsolicited feedback. That's not to say that we should just hold back until someone asks us what we think about something. Not at all. Like I said before, it's a balance between meeting our needs and meeting the other person's needs as well. 
The problem with providing unsolicited feedback based on a certain topic or issue is that it's all too easy to make conclusions about what someone is or isn't doing and give them the feedback based on those conclusions without being curious about it first. Not only is that unfair to the person in question, but it also makes them far less likely to listen to what we have to say, even if we do actually have a good point. So if we have a yearning burning to give someone unsolicited feedback, what can we do? The first thing is to ask their permission and just be upfront with them. When we're feeling pretty nervous around talking about something, we can feel the need to just blurt it out as quickly as possible. However, it's a good idea to make sure our conversation partner actually wants to talk about this first. So bringing this up might look something like, I've had some feelings come up around a certain issue concerning our friendship lately or a certain thing that you're doing or this XYZ project that you're working on and I was wondering if it would be okay to talk to you about it. Otherwise, the basis for the conversation becomes, I'm going to tell you this piece of feedback whether you like it or not, which is not going to be very helpful. The second tip is to keep it about you and your feelings and only address issues that are directly relevant to your friendship. If it's not directly relevant to the friendship, it's not our place to bring it up. For example, if I had a friend who was a bad driver, I wouldn't approach the conversation saying, look, you're a really bad driver and you really need to sort it out. Instead, I could either say, when I'm in the car with you and you drive this way, I feel really scared because I value my life. Or when I hear you talk about the way you drive, I feel really worried because I care about your safety. Giving feedback is a generous thing to do, so it's a great opportunity to be totally generous with our feelings as well and to engage in that expressiveness that we talked about with the positive feedback. The third tip is to keep an open and curious mind. If we go into a conversation with ready-made conclusions and no curiosity about what our conversation partner actually thinks and feels, we have to question why we're having the conversation with them. If we've decided what's going on for them in advance, then the fact we want to have the conversation is probably more to do with our own stuff than anything that they're bringing to the table. Just as we need to keep an open mind about what they're thinking and feeling, we need to keep an open mind and keep questioning our motivations for having the conversation with them in the first place. Telling our friends what they do or do not think isn't going to be helpful to them. Only they really know how they think and feel. And unless they've specifically told us, trying to tell them how they think is like saying, I know how you feel better than you do. The fourth and final tip for providing unsolicited feedback is no psychoanalyzing. It's not our place to do it. And if it happens repeatedly, it will damage the relationship. Psychoanalyzing produces an inequality in the interaction and takes away the curiosity and honesty. We are not there to be our friends or our partner's therapists. We're there to be their friends. The relationships are totally different and it's not healthy to blur the boundaries between the two. Daniel Mackler, who is an ex-psychotherapist, has a great summary of the difference between approaching someone with friendly curiosity and trying to be their therapist on his website. And I'll just quote this quickly here. This is what he says. It's acceptable for a friend to ask any personal question for the sake of his own personal growth, but only insofar as it respects the delicate balance of the friendship. This requires much patience, self-awareness, and appropriate mutual self-appraisal on the part of both friends. On the contrary, it is rarely appropriate for a friend to ask or request a question intended to stimulate the other to grow or explore. That is a therapeutic question and does not belong in a friendship. If we want to provide genuine and heartfelt feedback, it might take a few goes to get it right, especially if this isn't something that we're used to doing. By approaching a conversation with respect for both parties' feelings, however, we can make a huge difference to the communication and quality of our relationships. That's it for this week. If you have any questions, comments, or additional tips for giving constructive feedback, I'd love to hear them, so email me at hannah, that's H-A-N-N-A-H, at becomingwhoyouare.net. Thanks so much for listening today, and I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Becoming Who You Are podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a review. You can get in touch with Hannah by emailing H-A-N-N-A-H at becomingwhoyouare.net. Don't forget to visit becomingwhoyouare.net and find out how you can use rational personal development to live an authentic life.